Hello and welcome to Skein Dare Knits. My name is Ellie and I am a Norwegian living and knitting in London. And you can find me on Instagram as Skein Dare and as a designer on Ravelry under the name Skein Dare Knits. And more importantly, you can join my Ravelry group Skein Dare Knits, which is the best place to take part in knit alongs and potential giveaways and chatter best place to get in touch with me, the best place to get pattern support. I give my group number one priority between all modes of contact. Uh, I, I should probably touch upon email, n not an option. Um, Instagram messages, kind of messy, it's not a very good platform. So I really do appreciate if everyone who wishes to get in touch would use the group. That would make my life easier because I only have one place to focus on and it's just such a good place to be. Obviously if there's anything that is of a very sort of private concern then my uh, inbox on Ravelry should do. And yeah, welcome to this podcast. Welcome to returning viewers. So good to have you back and welcome to new viewers. This is my knitting podcast here on YouTube. I mainly just sit here and chat about knitting for an hour. It's not a class or a tutorial or anything like that. I just kind of talk about knitting and what I am knitting or designing or doing that is kind of fiber related otherwise. And I am currently doing vloggers, which is not particularly fiber related, apart from me living a very fiber rich life. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. I have really enjoyed getting your feedback. I have enjoyed doing it, even though my days have gone a bit up and down. That's fine. I have just, yeah, it's just like a little snippet of every, every day, uh, about five minutes every day that I show you around East London or whatever else I'm up to this month. I am going to Oslo in two days and from there I am going to Frankfurt and from there I am going to Munich and hopefully also popping by Pfaffenhofen where the Wollmeister shop is and I might hope to see my friend in Ingolstadt as well. So I'm gonna kind of be a bit all over the place. I'm also gonna see my friend in Ulm which is a tiny little city that I look forward to see. It's gonna be a lot of places. It should be very interesting but yeah it's not uh so much focused on the knitting so if you're only here for that then it's fine if you're not watching the vlog uh it's really just for people who want that little bit of bonus content and like i said i have enjoyed making it and it's also given me a lot of sanity to just be like a couple of days ahead i tend to upload like three episodes or videos vlogs all at once so that's kind of yeah kept me a bit sane so yeah i just wanted to touch on that and remind you that that is something i am doing in case you're wondering what all those old little short videos are for. <laughs> I am also the hostess of three knit alongs. I don't know how this keeps happening. Two of them are mitten related, not particularly surprising. So one is the year long mitt along, which is basically 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 where we aim to make six pairs of colour work mittens for the duration of 2018. <laughs> As I've said previously, I have not yet started an FO thread because I do expect everyone to make a collection of six pairs of mittens, that is 12 individual mittens, and I would prefer if they were all in the same photo. I understand for some of you that's not an option because you gifted them, that's fine, uh, but at least I want to see them all in one post. Uh, and that will be probably open the 1st of December or something like that, so you have a month to enter. And the other knit along I am hosting is the Skeinder Sock Along, which is only going to be open until the end of August, but it's been running since I think March or April or something. So it's been around for a while, but I thought we'd keep it open a bit longer just because it's it's a good time for sock knitting, summer. It really is, because it's been blazing hot here, which everyone watching my vlog will already know. It's just been completely unbearably hot at times. I've uh, really made good use of some local air-conditioned coffee shops that have given me some peace of mind that I can actually do some work in and that's been good. But yes, I reckon we are in a lot of similar situations in the Northern Hemisphere, so keeping the sock knit along open until the end of the month so you can enter then. And any pattern of mine that is a sock pattern is eligible. Lastly, I am running the second Selber Mitten Club, which is both a pattern subscription club and a knit along. The knit along will run until the end of January, but the club will be done by the end of the year. So to explain how this club works, in case you didn't see last week's episode, I have sold a collection on Ravelry. It currently only has one pattern, which is like a bonus pattern, a Aran weight mitten pattern. These are the mittens in question. I'm gonna talk a bit more about them later, but yeah. 
and when you buy that collection you do get this bonus pattern but you also get a new pattern every month until the end of the year so that is four pairs of colorwork mittens that for each pair you are getting a little bit more advanced in your color knitting color work mitten knitting skills and the first pair is very simple it's very quick to make a lot of people have proven that you really you can make them all in one go because after less than a day of the pattern being out there were finished iron weight salver mittens out there so i thought that was really fun to see i say iron weight i'm sure there are chunky weights and heavy worsted weights that you could use as well we are uh you know recommending a woolen spun yarn which is quite flexible when it comes to gauge it kind of defies gauge almost and you will see that a lot during this club and it's something that i hope to kind of educate everyone about because i think it's very exciting and yes so in september the first mystery pattern will come out it will come out in full with photos and everything there's no mystery there it's just that you won't know what it's going to be like until the first of september i am very proud of this pattern it is one of my favorites it's a little bit risky putting one of my favorites up so soon but yeah it is a dk weight mitten pattern it uses roma three ply yarn but uh, you can use any dk heavy worsted uh, sorry light worsted heavy sport kind of in that realm um i've listed a plethora of recommended yarns and as a comment on that i do want to say i can't comment on what yarns will be good unless i have tried them or at least know them a bit intimately uh so i do want to urge you to not just like contact me asking me will that yarn work because if i haven't tried it i can't really tell you all i can tell you is non super wash preferably woolen spun if it's a two or a three ply that's great and i mean ply literally the number of plies in the yarn and yeah that is mainly a sheep wool obviously just look for yarns that have similar specifications to the yarns i have recommended that's really the only advice i can give you i can't really comment further on that i don't know about say yarns from the other side of the planet so but the group on Ravelry, my group on Ravelry, is a really good place to ask about these things because you can get in touch with other people who live all over the world and may actually have tried that yarn for my patterns or similar patterns. So it really is the best place to make sure that if you aren't sure about your yarn choices, there is, you know, there are places to ask that has a wealth of knowledge that goes way beyond mine. And yes, there will be another pair of DK Whip Mittens as well for October. For November, we are going to have what I say is a sport weight pair of mittens. And then December, fingering weight. But really, you can use the same kind of yarns for both of the two. They're not really that different. They're different in stitch count. So the November mittens will sit somewhere between December and uh, October and September. In terms of how quick they are to make and how advanced they are. I'm gonna have to say that I did uh, knit the November mittens the other day and they turned out a little bit long. So I'm gonna have to shorten them down a little bit, otherwise they're gonna like go a bit up here. Um, but I am thinking I might include the long version in like an appendix or something for those of you who really do want a long mitten hack, just in case. Uh, so, you know, when life gives you lemonade, so you're gonna include the lemons in the pattern. <laughs> How do I come up with this stuff? So yeah, as of a finished object thread, I'm thinking I will open that on the 1st of September when things kind of officially kick off. Obviously, any um, knitting of these mittens will be eligible as well. These are the iron weight mittens, not to be confused with the earlier DK weight mittens. And what else? Yes, there is an FO thread for the sock along socks. <laughs> so that's already there. You can enter and you probably should enter by before the month is over. And yeah, I launched the mitten club last week and... It's been a week. I first of all want to thank you all so much. Honestly, the enthusiasm around this year's club went way beyond my expectations. And I know I said that last year as well, because last year I thought, you know, we're going to have a handful of subscribers and it's going to be nice and fun. Because I had a, like a smaller color work mitten knit along earlier and I thought it's going to be kind of like that size, maybe a little bit bigger, you know, and then it just went and I was like, my podcast grew as well. And I thought, you know, that was probably part of the reason and this year i mean my podcast been quite stable across the summer you know it's not a high season for knitting and i thought you know it's probably going to be maybe a bit like last year maybe a little bit less because people have already done it but i'm trying to introduce something new we'll see and it's big it is big i mean i'm not going to give away any numbers because it's quite personal but 
consider that last year's club has been up for sale for a year and this year's club is kind of neck and neck with the number of participants in it. That to me is kind of nerve wracking and amazing and I am so excited and thrilled and grateful to all of you who have joined. I mean, oh, I can't even. I never thought I'd say I can't even, but there you go, I can't even. And I also want to comment on that. Uh, the pattern is, the club, sorry, is still discounted. I've had a few questions asking, I didn't get a discount when I bought it. Well, it's written on uh, the ebook page where you buy it that I have manually adjusted down the price so that it will guaranteed apply to everyone until it is no longer there. And when it's no longer there, I will remove the text that say it is discounted, okay? So you will guarantee I've gotten a discount. And if it doesn't look like you got it, it is because Ravelry adds VAT charges for anyone who is in the EU or Australia, possibly also other countries, but I think that's mainly it. And that money does not go to me. I have to, at the end of each month, pay to their respective countries where purchasers are from. So I will have to pay that VAT back to Australia, back to the United Kingdom, back to Germany, you know. So it's just a very brilliant system that Ravelry has come out so that people can still live of pattern writing and being the designers without being bogged down with admin that is just too much to manage for each and individual designer. I am so utterly grateful that Ravelry has done this. It is a brilliant system, but yes, it does add a 10 to 20 to 25% charge or whatever you buy, depending on where you live. If you're in the States, you're completely off the hook, you lucky devils. <laughs> so yeah, it varies from country to country. I can't obviously com comment on every country. So that is just something to be aware of. It is discounted, even though it doesn't look like it because I put down the price. So it's just gonna have a lower price until it's no longer the lower price. And I have a bit of a confession. <laughs> it's bit, the first like few days was a little bit rough. We had a bit of a rough start and I am deeply embarrassed and also very humble that people have really been so very kind and understanding and patient of this. Uh, I would like to treat it as a thing of the past, but because it happens to everyone, I thought it might as well, you know. Because I don't know about you, but I join a lot of kind of pattern subscription things and I have, I'm very often the first to buy a pattern when it comes out if it's something I have been excited about. And usually in those cases, in the first couple of days, there is an errata. An errata is when the pattern is being updated with fixing an error or making an improvement that someone has pointed out that test editors or tech editors fa fail to notice. And it it can happen, it's a human error. We are all humans making this, it's not machine made. Although the use of spreadsheets can almost make it feel as such, it's human error happens and it happened to me. And I don't usually comment on these things. If it happens, it, it happens. And I, I saw the error, I was notified of it, I fixed it and I was ready to upload it. But then I noticed a inconsistency between the pattern and the photo. So my photographed pair of mittens had this column of white stitches completely undisrupted all up here and it looks really nice it's not going to be a crisis if it does get disrupted put on the kind of the thumb stitches and then cast on over it's not the end of the world but i thought i wanted to be perfect and i also think given i took close-up photos of this particular part of the mitten to help beginners see how the gusset is formed when there is like gaps in the chart what that means when you see it I can't leave that in there so I was like okay I'll quickly fix that change the numbers a bit and that is where the whole domino effect happened where that little fix was inconsistent with a lot of the other stuff of the pattern really really trivial stuff that really didn't make or break the mittens because people continuously kept producing completely perfectly fine mittens but in my mind this was the worst thing ever and I'm like I will not accept any errors, any imperfections in my pattern. And of course you shouldn't. Like, if it's gonna be for beginners, which is really what I am aiming for with this, same as the original Sarbamitten patterns of mine, it can't have any errors that makes someone completely new to colorwork mittens question themselves. 
so I had to fix it and when I thought I had fixed it and put that up there I was like sorry it's a second update thank you for your patience there we go I was then notified of some saying that they'd not actually received a new file but the new file was up there and I don't know what happened there so I tried to do it, fix it again and this time I'd actually had a number of people look at the pattern because I thought I'm not going to do this again I'm not going to spam people with more updates because it's just going to make people feel like questioning the pattern, feeling insecure, and it's not a good kind of psychological effect of many uh, updates. So I had lots of people look at it, various knitters who had knitted the pattern, thank you so much, and good friends of mine who are very techie minded, um, and I think we nailed it, and it actually had some other improvements as well, which I'm very happy to have been able to include. And so then I changed the file name so that now you can definitely know if you have the latest file. It is now called Speedy Cyber Mittens by Skeiner Knits, something like that. Um, it used to be called Org Mittens by Skeiner Knits, like August Mittens, because I thought I'd just name them by the month, but I'm, I am going to give them individual names related to the village or the area of Sarbu. So. <laughs> might as well but now you know if you have the file called speedy cyber mittens by skin your nets i think it's a zero one before that because i want it to be numbered by when they come out if you have that file you're good you're good we're good i am so sorry i i don't think this amount of fixing of a pattern once it's actually been sold is acceptable i am very like kind of uh yeah a bit ashamed and honestly no need to beat me up over it because i'm already doing it myself so I'm just glad it's I'm re I'm just really glad it's a thing of the past. It's probably a bit silly of me to bring it up, but I thought I would just reassure everyone who got these updates and started to wonder what is going on. It's all fine now. So now I am just really, really excited about the prospect of this club, where it's gonna go. Um Oh, it's so exciting. I have, you know, there are a couple of lucky individuals out there who have gotten to see the full collection of mittens and they have been very, very kind in what they've said. So I hope that means that you are going to love them and how they look. And yes, I do have bundles for the different yarn weights. I did not make a bundle for the iron weights, but for the DK and the sport slash fingering, they are two separate bundles. They are linked down below. Um, they just give you a plethora of yarns to choose from. Again, if you don't find yarns there that you can access where you live then do pop into the Ravelry group and ask around. I do also have the Norwegian help desk thread which has a lot of links to online yarn shops that send, send yarn to various places in the world that lots of people have helped contribute to create so that might be useful for you as well. That was a lot of admin before we actually get into whips, which is good because I don't have that many whips. I have been practically monogamous this week, which is quite unusual for me. Yes, I have been cranking out some mittens here and there for various occasions and things, but I have primarily been working on a tank top. But before we get to the tank top, I did actually pick up another project of mine that's been languishing for some time last night, because last night the temperature finally dropped and it was raining and I was so happy. <laughs> So in that happiness, I felt like picking up floof, very noisy floof. I don't know if you remember, but I am designing a plain stockinette silk mohair and wool sweater, which looks like a bolero. It's because I'm going to knit down the body. It's going to go down to the waist, so like a bit longer than cropped, but not down to the hips. Like, you know, it sits in the waist. But, you know, it's a top down, so really after this point, you can go rogue and do whatever you want. I just kind of wanted to try a silk mohair sweater with a fit that I haven't seen before anyone else do basically. So I am now almost done with the sleeve. Both sleeves are kind of hanging off and the body's there and there's like two strands coming off each and it's just been a mess that I haven't really wanted to tackle but I'm doing it now so that you guys can just do one thing at a time which is going to be a lot nicer to follow in the pattern. So the rib is happening. I'm going to make it about mm, I'm thinking six centimeters like two and a half inches something like that. I think that's it and uh, I hope to make it like it goes just up here so you can fold it back if you don't want it that long but you can also kind of snuggle up in it because it's going to be a rather warm sweater and I love the color so much so yeah I don't really have much else to say other than you know it's now been worked on again I hope it will come out soon it's the thing that I thought maybe would have been out for testing it by now but it is not and yes, I want to talk a little bit about test knitting. There will probably be at least two, if not three, calls for garment test knitting from me very soon. 
I have one garment that will be published soon, which is quite exciting. So that will come out maybe even before I put up this video. I don't think so. They will all come out on Instagram. So yeah, I will probably put those calls out on Instagram. Please don't private message me. I really only want the calls for test knits where I ask for them to be. Because otherwise, when I finally sit down and go through everyone who volunteered, because it's not on a first come first basis, it's really when I feel like all of the ones interested have volunteered, that is when I will go through it. And I will only go through it where those people have said I would like to test it. So private messaging is not going to give you an advantage. I'm just going to literally miss out on that. And yeah, I have another huge garment thing that I am still working on. It's probably going to be a while until that call of test knits comes out. It's quite a involved project. It will need a lot of uh, commitment. Um, so that's not any time super soon. But yes, I hope to put up a call for Floof soon and it will all happen on Instagram. So just stay tuned there if you're interested. But I do want to comment on a bit of what test knitting is. I, I didn't really plan anything for saying this. I thought I'd do a planned video on test knitting. And if that is something you want, then please do, you know, say something about what you would like me to cover maybe in the questions and answers thread in my Ravelry group. So I kind of know what other knitters or designers or people that have been test knitters would like for me to clarify or just raise issues or questions even things that are just worth putting into people's minds um one thing i've thought a lot about lately is what motivates people to test knit because why would you knit to a deadline why would you knit a pattern that isn't really perfect yet to a deadline well you get a free pattern, which is quite nice, and you get on-site support pretty much. You know, you have kind of an exclusive access to the designer telling you things more clearly, so you can actually be more helped than you can expect for having, you know, bought the pattern for, say, five pounds. Because really, as much as I think a designer should be there for someone who buys their pattern, it's just five pounds. You can't expect several hours of their time. Whereas if you do a test knit, you probably have a lot more of their time invested in your knitting um and i think some people thrive on deadlines it's actually something that helps their knitting and i'm thinking a lot about the motivation for a free pattern because i think that's valid like why not but it's not a quick scheme to get a free finished pattern that is not what it's supposed to be a test knit is where you get a pattern that may have lots of errors, that may not be finished, that may still need changing and improvements and will be updated regularly and it's not going to be perfect and I think that is something to remember. You may actually have to find that you have some errors in your finished garment or you may find yourself having to frog. I usually, I don't like doing that. I don't like saying, oh yeah, fix this thing now. Those of you who knitted further need to go back. I usually say it's fine if you've gone beyond that. But it is part of the process that you are in the trial phase. You are a, you're not even a better knitter, you're like an alpha knitter. You're just kind of trying it out for the first time. So. I think that's important to remember because I sometimes when I get a huge number of test knitters I sometimes wonder do everyone really want to have a pattern with a bit of you know quirks <laughs> so I think that is just something I wanted to say and about the deadlines for the things that I have test knits for I mean the two two of the patterns will be self-published so the deadlines will be a bit more flexible then but it's always going to be the case that the sooner my test knitters lovely and helpful as they are and I'm so grateful to have them. The sooner they're done, the sooner I can get the pattern out there. And as for fixed deadlines, they usually happen when someone else, at least in my case, I can't speak for every designer because some designers really work from a very strict kind of schedule. But for me, it's usually when someone else has put the deadline, like if I am getting published or something like that. And it's it's probably going to be the case for the pattern I am getting published now that I can't really say much about. It's It will probably have a very strict deadline and secrecy and all that stuff. So you kind of have to be in it for the whole thing, not just for the free pattern, but also for the ups and the downs of it. And which is why I am so incredibly grateful for having people volunteer for test editing because sometimes I'm just like, thank you. <laughs> there's not really much else to say it's just really cool that people want to help out with these kinds of things and kind of see the behind the scenes of the pattern making so to speak 
Now to the project that I've been working most monogamously on this particular week. I was going to say month. That would never happen. I'm not that monogamous. But this week, it's been so hot in case you missed it. <laughs> and uh, it made me, for the first time ever, give in to the summer garment thing. I haven't gone so far as to knit with linen. That's not happened to me yet. Who knows? There is a pretty good source of linen in my local yarn shop. So maybe one day. But uh, no, I have cast on Anna Maltz tarmac tank. And if you watched the Kilter Craft podcast, you may already have seen it knit there. And that was one of the first kind of nudges that I might actually want this thing. So this is how it looks like from the front. Yeah. So it is happening. It was a bit of a slog when I was just knitting it back and forth because of my issues with purling. That's a complete personal thing. So first I was like, I was just knitting the straps and they were back and forth and then it was increasing and just leave it there. It's quite encouraging, wasn't really that much. Same thing with the other side. Then I had to cast in the back and it was just purling, purling, purling right down here, right? There's a lot of purling happening here and I can't believe I did it as quickly as I did. I just wanted to get through it. Sometimes I'm quicker with things that I'm actually not enjoying the process of. Having said that though, I have enjoyed the process of this thing. It's been a really cool thing to, to construct words. And now I'm really enjoying just knitting stockinette in the round while increasing with this kind of eyelet increase that is happening here. It's quite a breeze now, I will say. And yes, I am knitting this in Holst Coast. This is the first time I am actually knitting with Holst Coast. Uh, it was actually quite dark when I started knitting this because I'd come home quite late and my window's been shut all day and it was so hot here. So I had to keep them all open, but because it was dark, I couldn't let the moths come in. So I had to keep the lights off and I was like, well, where is that coast yarn? And I don't even remember what colours that is. I think it's like a light and a dark grey. So I'm just going to start casting on. And I woke up the next day and it's a, a navy blue and a dark grey. Well, medium grey, perhaps. And I quite like it. And it's like someone else has knitted it because I didn't remember choosing these colours. Now I have them and I really, really like them. Yeah, so it's quite oversized. Uh, I had to choose the largest size to get the amount of positive ease recommended. And this is something I've noticed a lot from uh, magazine published patterns lately is that the range of sizes, they've gotten quite narrow and a lot of them have started to incorporate positive ease because that's quite trendy right now and I quite like that too. But that makes my size come at the very end because even though there's lots of positive ease, it doesn't seem like the sizes are skewed towards that so that, okay bust measurements of 42 inches which would normally maybe be kind of not in the center at all but like a bit off but not at the very end suddenly now when you add the positive ease it's at the end because the measurements haven't really changed i don't know if that makes sense and yeah it's a thing i've noticed across a lot of uh, magazine published patterns lately i'm not sure if it comes from that admin side of things or whatever but what I've found when I have calls for test knitters is that the normal curve of volunteers and the sizes they've said they want to knit often is kind of just over the size below mine. So I'm still kind of within the normal curve, actually. I think it's a very, you know, sedentary, it's not the word, sitting down hobby. So maybe a lot of us are a little bit rounder. And I do react a bit to how a very common size is not included. Obviously in the ideal world, every size in the universe would be included, but obviously you have to have a cutoff point at some point, or you end up like me who includes 15 sizes in their garments. Um, maybe not cut it off where there are still lots and lots of lots of people to knit it. I, I feel awful saying like this should be cut off at any point because there will always be someone excluded, but like try, like a bit of an encouragement to everyone making magazine. Don't have a cutoff point where you're going to lose a lot of people just for the interest of the magazine. That's just kind of my thoughts. I, I wish it wouldn't be that nobody would be excluded because of their size. But if, if that's a thing that will happen regardless, maybe don't exclude common sizes. I feel like I'm a little bit mean for saying that because 
I would love for everyone to be included. Anyway, back to the project. Really enjoying this thing. Absolutely, it's gonna have so much extra room and positive ease and it's just increasing from the underarm and through and through. So it's gonna be quite roomy and good to wear when it's hot because it's probably gonna come back. I say it's cool down today. We are still at 24 degrees, so it's not cold by any means, but I can record an episode without melting on the camera, which is pretty good. So I think I am now going to segue from this project to talk about yarn. I, like I said, I'm using Holst Coast for this. These are the yarns in question. There's navy and there is charcoal. And altogether, this project probably costs me six pounds. It will depend on the eye cord that I add, if I'm gonna add the eye cord with this, with this yarn, if there will be anything left, or if the eye cord will be a different yarn that may add some to the price point. <sighs> But I have some things to say about yarn and prices and quality and responsibility and yarn snobbery and yarn snobbery snobbery. There's a lot of topics to tackle here. I did not make any notes. I'm just going to talk from my brain. We know how that can go. So bear with me. If you're not interested in this little ramble, then at the very end of the episode, there will be a acquisitions. And that's about all I have for you today. But yes, I... <sighs> I'm very happy to make a top that's only six pounds in yarn price. Obviously, there's an added price to the time I'm investing in it, yada yada. I don't really think about that because this is for me. But really, a top for six pounds in a 50 50 lamb's wool and cotton yarn, that's pretty good. But I am aware that to some, there's a bit of an alarm bell going off because it's cheap and cheap to some is bad because there seems to be a night this idea that a high quality yarn will always cost more and maybe in all fairness it will maybe actually when you've taken in all the ethical repercussions into mind and production and such and such maybe that will up the price point but there are actually quality ethical yarns out there that you can knit for a very low price and I don't think I just don't agree that people who don't have the budget for some yarns should have to feel like they are stuck with yarns that they don't really like or that people uh, I don't know where I'm going with this but yeah I am just generally bothered by this idea that you have to pay more for quality things although I think in many cases that is true it is just not always true and the reason I feel like bringing this up is because there are those of you out there who actually just don't have that much disposable income and I want to say that I see you and I understand and I've been there I talked about yarn snobbery and similar things earlier and like gatekeeping and knitting and that kind of thing and I think I failed to mention that in my first maybe four years in London, four to five years, I had a weekly budget after paying all my rent and bills of about £50. £50 of disposable income to go to food, to public transport, to clothing, to the occasional flight home to Norway, to knitting if I ever bought any yarn. Um, that was my weekly budget. And the only reason I have more now is just because I take some jobs of university and I have patterns to sell. Uh, yeah, so I totally get that sometimes you really can't spend more on yarn and that is fine. I don't think you should have to. I think if you are on a budget, there is so much out there that you can knit. I mean, those of you in America, you have nitpicks. Not that I can comment on any of the sort of ethical sides of that, but I at least know it's an affordable, accessible yarn that you can order online and... It seems pretty pretty straightforward to me and they have a lot of nice non-superwash bases not my first choice but certainly not something i would avoid like the plague so that is one so that is just one thing i want to say you can actually make great stuff with great yarn for while you're on a budget you're probably still gonna have to eat a lot into your budget just because because all things are gonna cost something so I, I completely understand that and while I'm gonna mention a lot of affordable yarns here now it's not in the attempt of enabling people to buy because I completely understand that talking to those of you who have less money 
I don't want to make you spend that little money you have. So that is not where I'm coming from, just saying there are options for you out there. And I do remember when I was on that budget, I thought once I have more money, I'm gonna buy all the like cashmere silk blends and I'm, and I'm gonna buy that expensive yarn that I now can't afford because surely that's gonna be great. And now I'm kind of like, I don't think actually that was great. Yes, I have gone up a little bit in the price point. I'm not, I'm not knitting with yarn that costs one to two pounds per 50 gram ball. I'm more up to maybe three to four pounds per 50 gram ball. Because instead of looking up at those like 10 pounds per 50 gram ball yarns that I thought I'd never be able to knit with until I had a full time job and all that stuff, I should have probably looked at the, the medium range between the yarns that I thought oh I can't afford that now and oh I can only buy the really cheap stuff actually it was just slightly up in price point to yarns like phenol which is like three to four pounds 50 gram ball so lots of the Roma yarns are quite affordable and they even do superwash merino yarns as well it's just that that's not Norwegian so my thinking then was that if I spent more I would get better yarn and I have learned since that that's not really how it works. There are just fibres that cost more because they're either considered more luxurious or actually the production of them makes it a higher cost yarn or both. So there are kind of two messages here. The stuff that is really low price can be utterly terrible but it can also be really good quality. Things that are really high price can be really good quality but it actually may not be. And that is one thing I wanted to get across and yeah Holst Super Soft and Holst Coast and all those yarns that Holst have are really the most affordable option I can think of but you also have Roma and you have uh, Knit Picks and there is um, Jameson, Jameson and Smith I would highly recommend that and I think you can easily get that in states and you got uh, Hildesvog they're one of my favourites it's a slightly higher price point again than Roma uh, but it's by far my favourite mill easily so that's a little bit of comment on yarn snobbery. It's not that low price is bad and if anyone's making you feel like knitting with cheap yarn is a bad thing then don't listen to them. Don't let them get you down. It's just not worth it. But having said that at the same time I feel like there is a little bit of yarn snobbery snobbery and this is something I've never heard anyone point out to me before. But there seems to be this sort of snottiness towards those that actually have the disposable income to actually choose to spend more on yarn. Uh, and it seems a bit weird to feel like that's an issue important to point out because these are clearly the more fortunate ones, right? They have lots of disposable income that they can spend on like really fancy schmancy yarn. And surely they are not, you know, victims here. They are pretty well off. But still, it's not cool to come to those people and say, oh, you're going to spend that much money on yarn. Like, it's none of our business what people spend on yarn. We do have ethical responsibilities, which is usually why I take issues with manufactured fibers in the yarn. I th so for instance I would like to have some nylon in my sock yarn just so that I know that the longevity of the socks will last longer. I feel like longevity in some ways justifies the use of manufactured fibers that is essentially plastic. When the yarn is 100% plastic I think we need to think about our responsibilities to use that because it will take at least a century for it to degrade and yarn that just isn't biodegradable I think no matter our finances we'd still have that responsibility and that is also part of the reason I want to point out that there is affordable yarn out there that you can knit with that isn't acrylic um, not because I am a yarn snob not because I want to shame those who don't have enough money to spend on other yarns or don't want to spend that kind of money on yarn which is also completely valid you don't all have to be as super into uh yarn and fiber and knitting as i am i'm not here to shame anyone for their choices but we need to think about our responsibilities and choosing microfiber is very dubious because it turns it's so so tiny and it goes through all the water filters and goes into our food and into us and it's it's a bit like the issue with glitter if you ever come across that and trying to put a ban on glitter because it's it's pollution but it's pollution we cannot see and that is quite yeah i don't want to be a part of that personally but on the flip side again when we're working with animal fibers with protein fibers we have the responsibilities of the being that grow that very fiber on their skin or otherwise such as you know how silk is produced which is different 
um, we have responsibilities and luckily there are options where we can buy ethically and affordably and I'm not an expert here and I'm not you know the best uh, I probably made lots of purchases that aren't very responsible I probably did just yesterday like you know um, not that I bought you on yesterday but you get what I mean it's not about being perfect and about making the best choices all the time but it's about trying it's about intending because that is how we get closer to actually doing so now I have touched upon different issues right there is the perception that quality and price is always related which it is not it is the issues of our ethical responsibilities it is the issue of being a yarn snob being snotty about someone using low price fibers and someone using high price fibers and making that your business when all of these things are separate issues right quality is a separate issue affordability is a separate issue yarn snobbery is a separate issue and ethical responsibilities is a separate issue and all these things are stuff that we need to keep in our minds and they are multifactorial and it's complicated and I don't have any straight answers for you and I don't think there needs to be it's never like oh never ever ever use manufactured fibers because sometimes maybe you find that that's most appropriate maybe you're knitting something that's only gonna be outdoors and you don't want it to biodegrade that fast maybe you for whatever reason can't use an animal fiber in this case maybe you for some reason can't use an affordable fiber or you have to spend a lot like there's just so many things I can't possibly think of all the occasions when things are gonna depend it depends that is the answer but we need to think about how we behave towards others not make other people's yarn preferences our own problem when it is not if someone wants to knit with the fancy schmancy and show that to the world then they can do that if someone wants to knit with the dirty cheap stuff and I say that in a positive way they can do that and they can show the world it's fine that's my thoughts on it those are my opinions anyway just think that we need to have multiple thoughts in our minds at once it's never a always yes always no never ever always always kind of thing i have talked myself into a corner of just babbling right now but hopefully i got a few issues out there without making too many like must do's um so now i just have stash acquisitions left because it's that kind of day for me i have been so fortunate this this past week i was surprised not once but twice from people who wanted to send me yarn and i'm so excited about what they sent me ah so <laughs> where do i begin well first of all um grace of the babbles traveling podcast i think it's called babbles something uh, she asked me if I wanted some S-Twist wool. I think it was coming from her stash, but then it was sent to me from S-Twist, so maybe it isn't now. And I, I don't know what the backstory is, but point is S-Twist and Grace sent me beautiful Irish yarn. This is one, lots of blue shades. I love it. I think they're each 30 grams and it's 300 meters per 100 grams, so I reckon it's a about 100 meters each which i think is wonderful and yes that is stwistwool.com hoping that was in focus i also got a red set red gray do we know anyone who likes red and gray so yeah very excited to have these i haven't even taken them out of the pack because i'm just like they're so pretty and pristine and i just don't want to so yeah thank you it's really really nice yarn it is a single ply non super wash quite rustic irish yarn and the irish wool production has been on a bit of a low in the past ooh, i don't know century half century it's really been just exported 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 and whilst a lot of this stuff is coming back to the uk it's not really returned at this at the same force in ireland and you can find actually grace talks a lot about this on her podcast over a plethora of episodes and yeah it's really good to see that some are actually taking matters into their own hands now and are producing irish wool again i'm not 100 percent sure uh to what extent this production is on the irish continent island uh if there's all of it or some of it or most of it but it is the pretty much most irish yarn i have ever come across and yes i do think this is very good for color work i do prefer to apply yarns for color work but i have seen Isolde used this very yarn for her Threitmuir sweater when she designed it so i have seen that sweater in person as well and it's really working out quite nicely with this yarn and that is a color work yoke in case you didn't know 
So yes, I do believe that this is good for colour work. And I'm very excited to try it and I hope this can be become be become that this could become maybe some mittens or a hat or something like that. It's quite a rough yarn, so I do think maybe handwear is more appropriate, but uh, we'll see what I come up with. Now, if you watched my vloggers, you will already have seen this, you will have seen the other yarn as well, but there was another person who thought to spoil me rotten. <sighs> Saskia of Ovis Etc. sent me this pile of her beautiful hand-dyed rustic yarn. I'm a little bit allergic to the word rustic just because it doesn't really mean anything but it seems like people get what I mean when I say it. It's non-superwash, it is lofty, I think this is all woolen spun and I love it so much. It is so beautiful. I'm going to show you all of this beautiful stuff one by one. This is her sock yarn, it is the Kem Kempish Hiding Shop which I do have some in my stash already but this is actually different from how it's been before. It looks a bit more plump which is, I think, a huge improvement. I already love the yarn, but it is quite a lot more lofty now. It has 15% nylon, and the rest of it is Kempish Hiding Shop, which I believe is a Dutch breed of sheep. So this is two times 50 gram skeins with 425 meters each. I believe the yarn that Saskia dyes is one of the closest things to my ideal sock yarn out there. And I hope really to design with this yarn because I love these colours more than I think I can express. But I think if you watched a few episodes of mine, you already know that. This colour is everything. I love it so much. Anyway. I also got a bunch of DK weight yarns of hers and I do believe this could be either more DK weight mitten designs or prices for the Cyber Mitten Club cow that I will be handing out at the end of January, but still. Though it's going to be hard to part with these colours, because... Uh... <laughs> so this is, both of them, Shetland DK. This is the Aubergine and Mauve, these, and the uh, Burgundy and what I think is Oak, but don't quote me on that. I love them so much. So yeah, two times 50 gram skeins, 240 e meters each. non super wash made in Holland. So yeah, I love that so much. Oh, all the colors that she dyes are beautiful. I can be quite fussy about colors. So it's really quite something for me when all the colors in this entire bundle are just gorgeous. There's another DK weight as well, but there's no way I'm parting with this one. Just, just putting that out there. This is uh, the colorways Mustard and Beige. And I love them. I'm keeping that. <laughs> and then this yarn. I thought I had it all planned out and ready for the final pair of uh, mittens for the Colorwork Club. But this might just be a good candidate for it. So if anyone wants to match that, I think, you know, I might just cast on those mittens in this yarn. I might do it in several yarns, but yeah. This is her Shetland fingering in the toffee and fog colorways. It's 100% Shetland wool, two times 50 gram skeins with 400 meters each, which is nuts. <sighs> They're so beautiful. I love mustard yellow. It's <sighs> yeah. Anyway, I'm done gushing. This, is, this was just too much. And uh, I don't really know what to say other than thank you so much. I I think this is like, I don't know, third time I'm getting yarn from Saskia. Uh, I feel absolutely spoiled and I hope I can do them justice, both for prices and for designing. Not that I was uh, told what to do with them either way, but I hope uh, to do some club mittens in them. And I do think they are all perfect for the club mittens. Fingering weight goes for the November and the December mittens and the DK weights works beautifully for the September and October mittens. So now you know that. If you wanted to use some hand dyed yarns, that would be a very good candidate for it. And that is pretty much all I have for this episode. So thank you all so much again for taking part in the second Sabre Mitten Club. I can't even tell you how grateful I am. It's it's gone way beyond my expectations, the membership numbers keep going up and I am completely now having to be mentally prepared for just how much of a big deal this is going to be yet again. And it is so nice as well because I have, you know, I keep hoping that maybe this could be my full-time endeavour one day. And it's, it's not really close to that yet, like sure it can match my student um, funding but that's not really stuff 
to live by and I was kind of waiting for autumn to see for this club to see how you know how sustainable is it for me and now it's looking more like maybe it is it's a bit too early to say it's not gonna it's not an income that's gonna match what I could expect I suppose with the level of education that I have so that's a bit of a it's not a lucrative business it's never been but for sure after a summer of you know people knitting less and you notice that and every yarn shop notices that as well it's really good to have this kind of vote of confidence happen um and it's very exciting and i kind of want to do more clubs like throughout the year like i still want the mitten club to be the main thing like my crown jewel at the end of the year but it would be really cool to do other clubs i was kind of aiming to do that with soccer last day but at the end of the day when i had made them i realized I didn't feel like there was enough variety between them to do that as a club. There wouldn't really be any continuity between them. You would just be getting kind of something a bit along the same lines every time. Which some people are really into. But I think if I was on the receiving end, I would probably want there to be a stepwise something. Like I am doing with the Mitten Club where you either go up in intricacy in the chart like last year. Or down in the yarn weight being thinner and thinner every month something like that so it'd be cool if I could do something similar for a club in the new year but am I gonna have time to it when doing the thesis I don't know now we are at the very end of the episode as I've already said all I have to say now is that I'm probably not going to be able to podcast record for some time because I am going to Oslo on Friday I am gonna stay there until the 18th I think and then I'm gonna head straight to Germany where I'm gonna be until roughly the end of August. So while there will be lots of vlogs for vloggers, I'm not sure I will be able to record where I am. I might give it a go, but I don't think so, realistically speaking. So I will see you when I'm back. It might be September, but hopefully it won't take that long. Maybe I'll get to do it last week of August. And as we are now joined by my neighbor's dog, I think it's time to wrap this up. So thank you all so much for watching. Thank you all so much for taking part in the Mitten Club. Thank you all so much for just making my rival group a really awesome place to be. And thank you for watching Vloggers, if I didn't already say that. Did I say that twice? Anyway, time for me to wrap this up. Bye.